This morning, I praise God that uh, he's brought you here well. And no, I'm not Wayne. All right, we'll start our service this morning by singing, Glorious is thy name, it says Psalm 113, verse 2. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's stand as we sing this song to the Lord, number 204, if you're looking in the handbook. We'll sing the first and the last verse in this. Blessed Savior, we adore Thee, we Thy love and grace proclaim. Thou art mighty, Thou art holy, glorious is Thy matchless name. Glorious, glorious, glorious is Thy name. Thank you so much for all that's come out this way this morning to hear thy word. We pray that each one of them will receive a special blessing. We pray for the ones that visit here, Father. We pray that you should be with them. Make them feel welcome here and here. We pray for that the church will give you praise and glory. And we thank you, Father, for all the blessings that you have given us throughout this week and throughout the past month and so. We pray for the ones who lost loved ones recently, Father. We pray that you should be with them strengthen her family. We pray for our loved ones, Father. We pray that you forgive us all when we fail them. And Father, most of all, we just thank you for all that you have given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 426, Victory in Jesus, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Love is due him 
He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me me with his redeeming blood. He loved me I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he is built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Well, good morning, Hillcrest. It's good to be here this morning. I have a few announcements for you this morning. Actually, I have a lot of announcements. Looks like March is going to be a very busy busy time for Hillcrest Baptist Church, which is always good. Uh, first, YEC is coming up youth on March 10th and 11th. Uh, we're going to put out more information probably this Wednesday on that, but uh, start preparing uh, your hearts for that youth and um, adults, church family, be praying for these youth as they, they go to the Youth Evangelism Conference. It's a wonderful time where we uh, get to hear God's word and sing and worship together uh, also coming in March it's hard to believe it's already the end of February isn't it I feel like we just took on Christmas stuff and March is here uh, and we're already planning for VBS and so on March 18th we're going to have a, uh, a vacation Bible school breakfast for all those interested in VBS and if you don't know if you're interested you are interested in helping with VBS so uh, come get a, a breakfast and learn what you can, what role you can play in VBS. Uh, the dates for VBS are June 19th through 23rd. Uh, there's going to be a parents' night out for children up through uh, fifth grade. Take advantage of that. Drop your uh, children off here. They will be under uh, good care, uh, and go enjoy a, a evening out together with your spouse or just by yourself if you want. <laughs> uh, Churchwide potluck. On the fifth Wednesday, right, on the fifth, no, fifth Wednesday night, talk about, I can't read very well, sorry. About that. March 29th is going to be a potluck, uh, I believe meat provided, meat provided, and bring a, uh, a dish, enough to share for your family, two families, two dishes, he ought to be up here doing it, <laughs> all right. I think that's all the announcements that I have. Lots of stuff going on. Uh, 
the youth have, have been busy putting together boxes that we're going to be distributing out to the, uh, the neighborhood and filled with uh, uh, all kinds of goodies and information. Uh, so be praying for uh, the youth as they and uh, for those boxes that they get put in hands of people who, uh, well, they all need to hear about the Lord. We all do. But uh, be in prayer for that as we uh, put that together and plan a date that we can hand out those boxes. Uh, but it is good to be here this morning, and we want to welcome you. We want to welcome our visitors for coming to Hillcrest. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to stand up, we're going to sing, we're going to shake hands, hug necks, or high five. So glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. You can be seated. I am glad to see you. Yesterday and the day before, I got phone call and text messages. I'm sick. I've got the COVID. I mean, it just kept, kept ringing and carrying on. So. We have an awful lot of people out sick. Uh, several families have COVID that's kind of going through the family, so we need to pray for each other. Uh, but be thankful that you're here. I guess three of you were thankful that you're here. <laughs> there you go. Praise the Lord that you are here. And breathing. Pulse still going through, blood running through your body, amen, and there you go, there you go. If you don't know it by now, we are praying for revival, not the normal kind of revival where somebody comes in and preaches a couple messages and then we get excited for a day or two. We're praying for a long-term revival, and I'll share some thoughts in a few minutes about that, but keep praying that, that God will, each one of us, will catch the revival spirit and uh, when it happens you'll know it because you change something goes on in your life that's just going to click and you'll just know that God has revived us let's go to the Lord and pray almighty what a wonderful God you are a merciful loving forgiving God you are the only God the only true living God there is and ever was we worship you, Lord. We come to this house to worship you. We live our lives for you. God, those of us that have invited you into our, our hearts, Lord, we ask that you would guide us through this life, through the, this day, through the next minute, and that we just feel the very presence of God around us. I pray, God, for those that do not know who Jesus Christ is. Maybe they've never heard, or maybe they've heard and rejected already, but I pray for their souls. I pray, God, that this country would see an outpouring of the Spirit of God upon people, lost people, saved people. I just pray, Father, for a great awakening, a great revival in this country. 
I thank you, Lord, for the revivals that are breaking out. Some of our colleges and some of the churches are catching on to that revival spirit. I, I just thank you, God. And, and I pray, Lord, that it could be countrywide and worldwide. We sure need it. We need you, God, to take control of this country in such a way that you bring people to their knees. Our leaders of our country, Father, they need God's hand on them. They're making decisions, Lord, that, that are not biblical, they're not moral, and so we lift up this United States of America to you, asking God that you would bring us back to you. And the Bible's so plain, if we'll return to you, Father, that, and repent of our sins and pray to you, that you'll hear our prayers and, God, you'll draw us closer to you. So I pray, Father, that for our church, for our country, for our world, be with Christians, Father, all over this world. I pray, Lord, for those that are sick. I ask, Lord, that you would touch them in a, just a great and mighty way. And, Lord Jesus, that they would feel you encouraging them and taking care of them. And, and they just trust in you. Pray, God, for those that, that are having surgeries come up soon. And, Lord, that they realize that you're in there, that you're in, they are in your hands, Lord, and, and you'll provide for them. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to hear some words about the Bible. I pray, God, that it all brings you honor and glory. And every thought that we have will be focused on you. Uh, Lord, we just want to say how much we love you and praise you. You are our true God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, children, come on down. We'll read uh, some of God's word in just a second, but let me ask you this. <clears throat> have you ever been scared? I think we all have. have we? Do you ever think God gets scared? He never gets scared. God doesn't. When you get scared, what do you do about it? Pray. Good answer. We pray. We read the Bible. That's a good answer, too. When we get scared, we need to depend on God, don't we? He's got these awesome things that he does for us. If we call on his name, sometimes he answers in ways that, that we just cannot imagine. So I'm going to read you some scripture, and it's out of God's word, where he surrounded uh, his servant with protection. And nobody knew this until they looked up and they saw these, these things. So listen to this real, real close, and maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. The Bible says there was an army that was surrounding the, the uh, servant of God. And the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, and there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Master, what shall we do? There was an enemy surrounding them, loads and loads of men in chariots and, and weapons ready to attack these two people. So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, picture that. There's two men there surrounded by an enemy, an army of I don't know how many thousands and thousands. And the servant of God, the man of God, says there's more of us than there are of them. That'd be like looking at our little circle here and somebody telling us, well, there's 500 more people around here that we can't see. So he answered, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And you know what he saw? Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire protecting them. Can you imagine that? looking up at a hillside and you're all scared and lonely and praying, help, 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 Lord, help me. And you look up and there's all those chariots and all God's army of angels 
protecting us. So next time you get scared, realize this. God has an army of angels all the time. And if you need to be taken care of, protected, ask God. He just may open up your eyes to those angels that are surrounded. You know there could be an angel right there. He's saying, Baron, what are you doing today? Nothing. I hate no better than that. Always, when you get scared, trust God because he's got his ways of taking care of us. Did you have a good time yesterday? Yeah. All right. This is Romans 5.20. God increased all the more. Grace greater than our sin. Number 329. Let's stand as we sing this to the Lord.
people bless and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness on us descend. Come holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear in this glad hour. Thou who Sovereign Majesty, may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. You may be seated. My question is, have you seen the man, and did he call your name? I hope so. Do you remember, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. Do you remember back years ago when they were disciplined to 
the backside. I can, when she was singing that song, you know, you're supposed to sing, I mean, think theologically and heavenly when you hear this, but I was thinking about Daddy. If I heard my name mentioned by my dad and used the whole name, Jerry Graham Harwell, I turned around and ran. I, you know, I knew I was in trouble. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 57. Only God can revive our hearts. I want you to hear that. Only God can revive our hearts. We're going to look at verses 13 through 21. Isaiah 57, verses 13 through 21. So let's start out with verse 13. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you, but the wind will carry them all away, and breath will take them away. But he who puts his trust in me and God shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. And one shall say, heap it up, heap it up, prepare the way, take the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy, who is a contrite heart and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not ever, I will always be angry, for the spirit would fail before me and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness, I was angry and struck him, and I hid and was angry, and he went on backsliding in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far off, to him who is near, says the Lord, I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. I want you to hear some thoughts about People that know the Lord that are not walking with the Lord, we call that backsliding. I also want you to hear what God expects from us and that he's willing to heal us. He's for willing to forgive us. So listen to this story about our country and see if it makes sense to you. Since its founding in the 1770s, America was known as a Christian nation. Many pilgrims were Christians seeking religious freedom. Many founding fathers were Christian. And many foundational documents expressed biblical principles. At beginning of the mid-20th century, America began to be known as a post-Christian nation as God was moved further toward the edge of public influence. And I wrote down, not godly influence. Is it harder to live as a Christian in a post-Christian nation than in a Christian one? And some would say so, yes it is. But in truth, it doesn't matter where we live, the biblical requirement for faithfulness as the way to please God is the same. The need to remain faithful never changes. Noah proved it is possible to live in a corrupt culture and still please God. His holy fear or, or holy reverence of God caused him to stand firm in faithfulness in spite of getting no support from the culture in which he lived. You may feel unsupported in your nation, in your home, in your workplace, but you can remain faithful to the one who always is faithful to you. Doesn't that affect all of us in one way or another? Remember the days of Noah as he led the Israelites out of Egypt and before they crossed into the Promised Land, before they crossed the, the Jordan River, God promised them that the land was theirs. And if you remember the story, they had been in the wilderness for 40 years, had the same promise, but the older generation died in the wilderness because they were disobedient and rejected God's word. They were disobedient to the word of God and, and they um, worshiped idols while in God's presence. Only the younger generation were able to pass over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. I tell you that because the same problem exists in God's churches today. Uh, in my opinion, and others that I read, many Christians are living substandard lives for the Lord. They haven't taken hold of the promises of God yet, or we grab hold of some and leave some 
sitting doing nothing with them. A revival in God's churches is needed today because we have gotten away from the Lord. So I want to share with you uh, it's kind of a lengthy commentary that I read on the kind of revival that we need today. In the mid to late 1800s when the Second Great Awakening had taken place there were a lot of attempts to create the conditions of a revival. Famous preachers such as Charles Finney and Billy Sunday were traversing the country, uh, setting up emotionally charged camp meetings where people were whipped up into a frenzy and they did crazy things. Charles Spurgeon spoke into that environment with a sermon he entitled The Kind of Revival We Need. And he, um, he wrote this, we don't need a revival of people whipped up into a frenzy doing crazy things. He said, we need a work of the Holy Spirit of a supernatural kind putting power into the preaching of the word. Inspiring all believers with heavenly energy and solemnly affecting the hearts of the careless so that they turn to God and live. We would not be drunk with the wine of carnal excitement, but we, we would be filled with the Spirit. We would behold the fire descending from heaven in answer to the effectual, fervent prayers of righteous men. Can we not entreat the Lord our God to make bear his holy arm in the eyes of all the people of this day? And the answer is yes, we can. He went on to list what a true revival looked like, what we should have in revivals today. A revival of old-fashioned doctrine, a revival of old-fashioned gospel preaching that um, would make the word come alive to the people that are listening. A revival of personal godliness, a revival of domestic religion. The Christian family was the defender of godliness in the days of the Puritans, but in these evil times, hundreds of families are so-called Christians. They have no family worship. No restraint upon the growing kids, no wholesome instruction or discipline. How can we hope to see the kingdom of our Lord advance when his own disciples do not teach his gospel to their children? That needs to be done today. I agree with Spurgeon. I don't think we need a revival of people whipped into certain frenzies and doing crazy things. I believe that we need a revival that changes us, that changes our heart, that changes our lifestyles, that changes our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm praying for for us. I don't necessarily think we need a preacher to come in here and preach to us three days, three nights, and make us feel good about ourselves, and then a week later it's gone. That's not revival. That's just a, a sermons that make us feel good. Isaiah 57 gives us instruction to the kind of revival that, that God would have us to have. So let's look at Isaiah 57 and start in verse 13. And, and as we read this, realize that, that God is leading us into a revival spirit in our own hearts. And it may not be church-wide. It may just be one or two individuals, but God's going to revive somebody. And hopefully he revives all of us. Verse 13, Isaiah 57, verse 13. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you, but the wind will carry them all away and, and a, a breath will take them. But he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. There's two points I want to share with you about this. The first part of 13 has to do with idolatry. The Lord's pretty blunt. I would deal with idolatry in a Christian's life. The wind will blow it away. He'll take it away. He'll destroy the idols in our lives if we allow them to overtake our, our own lives. I wrote down some thoughts I had about idols because I think all of us are, are, are susceptible to having idols in our lives. If you have grandchildren, be careful because they can become an idol in your life. If you have hobbies, they can become idols in your lives. If you have thing, anything that takes the place of God in priority, that becomes an idol. And these are the thoughts I had uh, about idols. If I can read my writing. Idols have no breath. They're dead. Many times they're carved out of wood. 
I've been to Taiwan and Korea both, and there's a lot of idolatry over in the Asian countries. And if you get in a cab over there, they've got these little wobble head things, and they put them all the way across the, the dash. And I asked one of the cab drivers when I saw all those, I said, what are all those things? He said, well, that's um, a god of something, and that's a god of something. Each one of those little bobblehead things he thought were idols. They were things he worshipped. He'd call on them in time of whatever trouble each one of those idols were over. Well, let me tell you, idols have no breath and no life. They have no power. You can pray all day long to an idol. You can enjoy your idols, but they have no power. They also have no satisfaction. You can worship idols and worship and worship, and you'll get no true satisfaction, and idols bring no joy. I'm talking about the joy that surpasses all your understanding that kind that God gives. They do this. Though. They bring false hope, and I think that's why God detests idols so much. You begin worshiping them and putting your hope into idols, so be careful. Verse 13 talks about idolatry, the first part of it. But then the second part of it, who can claim the land? Who can claim God's promises? Who can claim God's revival spirit, his blessings, those blessings that he just pours out on us? Who can claim those? And the instruction in verse 13, he who puts his trust in God. This thing is chock full of promises to us. As we put our trust in God, you can claim those promises. They're written for us. They're, they're available. I, I don't know how many promises are in the Bible, and I don't know how many promises God has made to individuals. But I guarantee you this, if he promised you something, it's available. It's kind of up to us to receive that promise by the way we uh, live. Get rid of the idols and worship Almighty God. Put your trust in God. Those who hold the, the fortress of Jesus... When I was talking to the kids, have you ever talked to kids, by the way? They're hard. I can sit down here every single Sunday I sit here. I've been doing this for 18 years with these kids, and I'm still scared to death of them. No, you know, you don't know what they're thinking. You know what you thought to tell them, and then when you look at them, you forget what you thought to tell them. And then they come up with some of the, the things. Y'all don't hear half what I hear, but... I thought about children in, in 13 and uh, verse 13, and, and they need to learn how to, to anchor to Jesus when we have problems, when we struggle. Whatever's going on in our life, uh, Jesus is our fortress. Also, who can claim, claim the promises of God is those who are obedient to the Word of God. This is Jerry's way of saying that. If he says it, do it. It's that plain, that simple. If God says something, we ought to be doing it. Those, according to verse 13, are the ones that are receiving God's promises, his blessings. Those that keep his word, those that are obedient to the word of God, those who worship him and put our trust in him. I want you to listen to David's heart in Psalm 16. And then we're going to go back to Isaiah 57. Verses 7 through 11. 16, verses 7 through 11. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence. It's fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Wasn't that easy to understand? We put our eyes on God. We trust in God, and, and God takes care of us. He's right there with us. So put away the idols and trust in the Lord Jesus. Keep on going, Isaiah 57, and look at verse 15. 
For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in high and holy place and with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Doesn't that verse sound like somebody that needs re a revival in their life? And he tells us exactly how to get that revival. You know without a doubt who's speaking in this verse. He tells us the high and lofty one, God is speaking. The God who inhabits eternity, the Bible says. This is our Lord. This is our God. He is the same God that Moses worshipped. The same God that David worshipped. The same God that Apostle Paul worshipped and wrote about. But listen to this. He is the same God that will be in heaven 10,000 years from now. He's the same God that will be in heaven 100,000 years from now. To eternity, that's who this God is. And he doesn't mind telling us that. Our God dwells in the holy and high places. And those who have a contrite and humble spirit, according to verse 15, are the ones that will spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we get to eternity, those are the ones that are going to be revived by the Lord. Those who have a contrite and humble spirit. Contrite means this, expressing remorse or penitence over sin. We're sorry for the sin in our life. We ask God to forgive us for our sins. And, and the Bible tells us in verse 15, if we're truly sorry, if we're truly repentant of our sins, if we truly ask forgiveness, he will revive us. And that deserves an amen. amen. Yes. Look at the last part of verse 15. God will revive the ones with a contrite heart. And that, beloved, is the kind of revival Hillcrest Baptist Church needs. A church that has a contrite heart and a humbled spirit. We all meet God on the same level. He's the high and lofty, holy God. We are the servants of God. We are the disciples of God. When God sends a revived spirit to a contrite heart, there's some things that change in us. If God sends you a revived spirit today, then you can look forward to these changes. First of all, he draws people closer to him when he revives our spirit. Are you drawing closer to the Lord? Do you look for Jesus in everything that you do? Do you look for Jesus every time you pray? That's what God does when he draws us closer to him. We, our eyes are open to the things around us. He draws us closer to him. He speaks to those with a contrite heart. Has God spoken to you lately? Has he spoken to your heart? He rebuilds the life of those with a contrite heart. You may think that you have a great life. But if it's not the life that God wants you to have, then you need a new life. He gives each one of us, he has a purpose for each one of us. And if we're on a different path other than where he, he's leading, then we're not going to accomplish his purpose. Do you need a life that's rebuilt? Is your heart a contrite heart, a humbled heart? God will reveal himself to those who have a contrite heart. Now, hear what I just said. God will reveal himself to you if you have a contrite heart. You'll be one of those who can look up in the hillside up there and see those thousands and thousands of chariots and fire surrounding them. That's how God reveals himself. Have you ever seen God revealing himself just to you? I can tell you right now, it will change your life. I saw Jesus in person. You know I'm not a Pentecostal preacher, but when I saw Jesus, I fell to my knees. 
and he changed me. Brother Bobby saw God as well. And it took a lot of changing to change Bobby. But it did change him. He still changed. So I'm asking you, have you ever seen God? Has God ever spoken to you? We're talking about a revival. I'm talking about a real revival, one that changes our lives, changes our lifestyle, changes the way we're, whether you're man or woman, where you feel towards your spouse, towards your family. You'll see God when this happens. He'll reveal himself to you. It may not be face to face, but you'll, you'll realize he's revealing himself to you. So my question is, how is your heart right now? And as you answer that question, I'm going to read to you about six or seven things that has to happen in a real revival. So first of all, let's run over to Psalm chapter 80. Psalms chapter 80. Verses 18 and 19. Psalm 80. Verse 18 and 19. Then we will not turn back from you, God. Revive us and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O God of hosts, because your face to shine and we shall be saved. Uh, several things in there. Revival will motivate you in your prayer life. You'll seek God. You'll, you'll call on his name. We'll not turn our back according to verse 18. We'll call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of revival. Revival will cause God's face to shine on you. How many of us sitting in here today, we really don't need God's face shining on us? All of us do, don't we? We need to feel that face. We need to, to have a renewed spirit of His face shining on us. A second thing that a revival does is gives you a hunger for God's Word. Run over Psalm 143. Psalm 143. Verses 10 and 11. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for your righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. When you are seeking revival, it gives you hunger for God's word, and, and you begin to pray like verse 11. Lord, revive me. Revive me and bring my soul out of the trouble that surrounds me. Destroy all those who afflict my soul. I'm yours, Lord. Teach me. Lead me. Revive me. Keep on going and look at Isaiah 35. Verses 3 through 7. When we seek revival, listen to verse 3. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fear, fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Will, with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Isn't that a great verse? He'll come, no matter what you're going through, he'll come and save you. Those with a contrite and humble heart. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. How, to me, that's a test of faith. How is our faith? Remember the blind man that was born blind and Jesus spit on the dirt and rubbed it in and, and he received his sight. Do we have that kind of faith to pray and expect God to do something because our faith believes that God can do it. Yes. Amen. Does your life seem like a that God has touched you and healed something? Verse 5 says, Call on my name and see what I do. Look at verse 6. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing, for water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. I wrote by this, does your life seem like a spring of living water? 
We read all the stuff going on in this world, all the, the stuff going on in the United States. We're surrounded by yuck. But according to Scripture, those with a contrite heart towards God, those that are serving God, calling on the name of the Lord and, and letting God be your refuge, we ought to feel like there's a stream of living water just pouring out of our hearts. Don't get discouraged. Get excited. That's what revival brings. Do we have a heart that's refreshed? All sorts of things goes on in life, but man, to have that joy and the refreshing that only God can give. That's what he's promised to us. That's why we need revival to receive some of these things that, that we're missing out on. True revival will give you peace from God. Isaiah 48. Verses 17 and 18. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord, my Bible says, your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments, then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. A peace like a river. Those of you that like to go to uh, bodies of water, some like the rivers, some like the lakes, some like the oceans. And there seems like there's a special feeling when you get around water if you like water. And you can just feel the presence of God seems like better than any other time. The, liver, the, the rivers of living water in our hearts. Real, real revival will change your heart and your priorities. Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 8. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and, it, and God will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And then God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. I love those verses. Are you seeking God today? Are you seeking his face, his thoughts? Now he's right up front with us. His thoughts are above our thoughts. But when we seek revival and we feel revival, his thoughts become our thoughts. He reveals his thoughts to us. I wrote down here, call upon him while he's near and return to the Lord and get away from, and I just put a blank and a period. And you need to fill in the blank. What separates you from the Lord? What separates you from having a real close relationship with the Lord? And it could be everybody has a different thing that they, they get caught up in. It's all sin. You're right. But each one of us has a different sin that we need to put in that, that, that blank. What keeps us from serving God the way God wants us to? Real revival will cause you to worship God in a very different way. Psalm 51 we're going to close with this. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12, and then verse 15. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. And then verse 15, Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall, show, uh, shall, for, uh, shall show forth your praise. Revival will cause you to worship God in a whole different way. I don't know how you read scripture, but I always have to go read it two or three times. And I love verse 12, restore to me the joy, God, of my salvation. And that salvation comes from God. Restore that joy to our lives. As pastor, that's one of the hard things for, for the pastor to help. So, so many 
Christian brothers and sisters have lost the joy in their lives. And I can't give it to you, and I sure can pray that God would restore the joy in your life. But the only way to re regain that joy is through the Word of God, through your worship of God. Restore the joy of your salvation to me, Lord. Everything I've shared with you these last few points were what takes place when God revives a church, when he revives a pit person. We're praying for revival, but we're not praying for the normal type, kind of revival. We're praying for long-lasting, effective revival that changes our lifestyles, changes our walk with God, that just excites us about being a Christian. So we're going to pray in just a second. We're going to close with an invitation, but can I ask you this? Are you excited about being a Christian? A child of God? And I hope you are because if you're a Christian, you're going to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. And if you don't get excited now, you're going to be excited later on and you're going to wish you'd been excited now. Does that make sense? Does that come out right? It is an absolute privilege and joy to be excited about your walk with the Lord. It just becomes part of your life and you enjoy it. You, you, it's it. That's it. And people see it. Your family sees it. Your bosses at work see it. Your fellow workers see it. People at Kroger's and Walmart and places like that, they see that you're excited about loving the Lord. They see that you have a different lifestyle. So let's pray, and remember, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you probably don't know what I've been talking about anyways today, but if you don't know Jesus, I would love to talk with you, and we call this an invitation. I invite you to come forward. I'll be standing right in front of these flowers, and come down and let me talk to you. I won't scare you, and I won't hurt you. I'll just tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, you don't have any kind of decision if you need to pray for. I'd love to pray with you. The altar's open to pray. But most of all, let's talk to the Lord and listen to what he has to say to us. So let's stand and, and we'll see what God does. Father Almighty, this is your time. I pray, God, that you speak to us and we'd respond to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 325. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want Thee forever to ransom my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. My faith for my cleansing, I see thy blood flow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, thou knowest I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought thee, thou never said no. 
Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want Thee forever to ransom my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow whiter than snow yes whiter than snow now wash me and i shall be whiter than snow Holy word. 